and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode is the third in a planned four-episode series about the Angevin English Empire, loosely centered around the life of Richard the Lionheart. We left off in July of 1191, with the Crusaders finally in control of the coastal city of Acre after a two-year siege. The great Islamic leader Saladin has retreated to lick his wounds, and the Crusaders are preparing to make a move on Jerusalem, which was, after all, the original goal of this entire crusade. Or do they? See, before they can actually make their move, domestic politics come into play. They have to decide once and for all who is the actual king of Jerusalem. If you will recall, there are some rival claimants here. Richard is backing his vassal, Guy of Lusignan, the former king. And meanwhile, King Philip is backing his own candidate, Conrad of Montferrat, who is right now sort of the de facto king of Jerusalem, right? He controls Tyre, and uh, without any practical way of getting him out of Tyre without starting a civil war, Richard and Philip come to an agreement. Conrad gets to keep Tyre, and he will get to take possession of Acre as well, but he will only be local lord in those two places. And when the Crusaders get back the rest of the kingdom of Jerusalem, Guy's going to get to have all of that. And after this agreement is made, King Philip decides he's going to go home to France. This is a violation of his oath as a crusader to go all the way to Jerusalem, but there you have it, he decides to go home. But this is going to cause some trouble, right? Remember, King Richard and King Philip's lands are right next to each other. They've been in conflict in the past. The whole reason they're on this crusade is to fulfill some oaths their fathers made when they were in conflict. If Philip goes home to France and Richard stays in the Middle East, well, in that case, what guarantee does Richard have that Philip isn't just going to take a bunch of his land or outright invade uh, while Richard's still in the Middle East? They have to come to some kind of arrangement if Richard is going to stay and lead this crusade. And... Here is what our anonymous English source, the Itinerarium Peregrinorum at Gesta Regis Ricardi, uh, what that source has to say. Quote, King Richard was of the opinion that the King of France should make an agreement with him to preserve mutual good faith and security. For just like their fathers, they revered each other with tender enmity cloaked in love. Unquote. I love that. Tender enmity cloaked in love. And the long and short of it is that Philip makes a promise not to take any of Richard's lands while Richard is still on the crusade, and to guarantee this, he leaves some hostages with Richard. And the itinerarium goes on, quote, Everyone is well informed of how faithfully he stood by his oath and agreement. From the moment he returned to his homeland, he shook the country and threw Normandy into confusion. To cut a long story short, taking his leave, the King of France left the army at Acre. Everyone wished him misfortune and gave him curses instead of blessings. Unquote. Now, we will talk more about events in England and the Angevin French lands in the next episode. But for now, just keep in mind that Richard is working against the clock. As he crusades, King Philip of France and Richard's own brother, John, are conspiring together against him. 
and if he spends too long in the Holy Land, he could lose his crown. In the meantime, he is being slowed down by thousands of Muslim hostages who he has taken after the Siege of Acre. He's actually got thousands more than he's supposed to have because when Philip leaves, uh, Philip leaves his hostages in Richard's hands and says, well, you just get whatever you can for him and pay me back later. And Saladin is supposed to be ransoming these people, but he doesn't. Right. He also, by the way, does not return the portion of the true cross, the supposed piece of the cross that Christ was crucified on that had been captured by the Muslims at Hattin. He's supposed to give it back, and he doesn't. And both of these things are probably delaying tactics, right? Remember, if Saladin pays for the hostages, they get set free. As long as the hostages are not set free, they're Richard's problem, right? He has to feed them, he has to house them, and come winter, if they're still around, he's going to be immobilized. I remember, Saladin has only lost one city. He's got this empire from Egypt up through much of the Middle East and into Syria, right? and his army's intact. There's still a war on. And by delaying the Crusaders, he can hopefully make their position worse and his better. And also, as far as not returning that portion of the True Cross goes, it's probable that Saladin can't find it. If you'll recall, that portion of the cross is lost to history after the Battle of Hattin. It, it may not even exist at this point. Anyway... Regardless of the reason for Saladin's procrastination, Richard eventually gets sick of it. And on August 16th, 1191, after Saladin misses yet another deadline to pay off the ransom for these hostages, Richard has finally had enough. Uh, he leaves the city of Acre. He sets up a temporary camp outside the city gates. And then he orders 2,700 Muslim hostages marched out of the city and out in front of his camp in sight of Saladin's embassy. And according to the itinerarium, the men-at-arms leap forward eagerly for this task. Richard marches the hostages out of Acre in front of the camp and orders them beheaded. As the massacre begins, some Arab cavalry try to save the hostages. They rush forward in sort of an impromptu charge, but there aren't enough of them, and a group of crusader knights drives them off. And Saladin watches helplessly as 2,700 hostages are slaughtered. In reprisal, he orders his own crusader prisoners slaughtered in the sight of the city walls. But with the prisoners taken care of, Richard is now ready to march. He's short a few men, though. Conrad of Montferrat won't leave the city of Tyre. King Philip is gone, and with Philip gone, uh, Conrad's worried that Richard will just sort of have him killed or arrested on some pretext as soon as he leaves his own city, uh, right? Because Richard backs Guy instead. Uh, so Conrad's not going to come on this crusade anymore either. And Leopold of Austria, the duke we briefly mentioned in the last episode, well, he has left. Uh, he left because Richard had insulted him during the Siege of Acre. Now, Leopold's only got a few hundred men with him. 
it's not like this small number of troops is going to be militarily decisive. But even so, Leopold will harbor a grudge against Richard. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But Richard still has Guy of Lusignan. They are still together, and they have most of their armies, as well as a number of men Philip left behind, and they have a new fragment of the true cross to inspire them, right? The one from the cathedral in Acre. Richard decides to take advantage of of Crusader naval dominance. Remember how at the end of the Siege of Acre, the Crusaders not only got to keep the city, but the Muslim fleet bottled up inside the harbor. Well, with all of these ships, what the Crusaders are going to do is to march south from Acre and hug the Mediterranean coast as far as they can. Right? This will allow them to have the fleet sail right down the coast parallel to the army, and the fleet can carry all the supplies and that sort of thing. And the plan is to go as far south as the city of Jaffa. Jaffa is roughly due east from Jerusalem, and it's also not that far north from the city of Ascalon, which is a fortress city near the Egyptian border. So by going to Jaffa, Richard's taking advantage of his fleet to get him as close to Jerusalem as possible. And then when he gets to Jaffa, he's going to have a choice. If things don't look good as far as taking Jerusalem goes, well, he can move south to Ascalon and threaten Egypt instead. Saladin is not just going to let Richard go to Jaffa, right? Again, he's still got his army. He just lost a siege. That's it. So as they march south, Richard's men end up being attacked. Saladin's cavalry archers strike them in the rear. Most of the men are on foot, and they're traveling fairly slowly. They're only moving at about four miles per day. It's summer in the Middle East. It's really hot. These men are heavily armored, and they need to stay cool, and they need to stay hydrated, and most importantly, they need to stay in formation. But because of this slow pace, they are very, very vulnerable to these mounted archers who can move very quickly. And on top of all that, most of the troops in the rear guard are French. They are men who King Philip left behind. And while these men are technically in Richard's pay at the moment, that means they're basically working as mercenaries. Right? Their morale is not as good as most of the other troops. And you know, if they start panicking and running forward, they could cause disruption to the entire army they start panicking and scatter they could all be killed well Richard can't have that so he gets together a bunch of knights from the front of the column and they charge down to the rear and drive off Saladin's archers and uh, shortly after this attack the crusaders stop in the friendly town of Haifa to resupply and Richard takes advantage of this opportunity to reorganize their marching order to make them a little bit more resilient to cavalry archer attacks. He positions elite Templar knights at the very front of the column, and at the very back, instead of these French troops of questionable loyalty, uh, Richard puts the other elite warrior monks of the Crusader era, the Knights Hospitaller. This makes the Crusader formation a whole lot tougher, and they proceed forward again towards Jaffa. Now, 
Richard's slow rate of advance might seem like a good thing if you're the defender, right? The slower your attacker is, the more options you have to respond. But in Saladin's case, a slow-moving opponent is actually a problem for him. See, Richard's army is well supplied by sea every day. They don't have to worry about running out of food. If they're somewhere without a lot of fresh water, they can have some ships go collect some from elsewhere. And in the meanwhile, Saladin's not getting a ton of supplies. Those supplies he does get either have to be obtained locally or shipped up by land all the way from Egypt. And with each day in the field, his army's position gets to be a little bit more dangerous. So he realizes that he has to force a battle with Richard at some point, and the sooner the better. So Saladin stops trying to harass this reformed crusader army and instead leads his faster army ahead down the coast to look for a better spot to lay an ambush. And he finds an area where the road turns inland from the coast, right? For at least a couple of days, Richard's army is going to be separated from their supply ships. And in addition, as they move along this road, they're going to come to a river, they're going to have to cross the river, and they're going to have to move through some woods. It's not just wide open terrain like a lot of what they've been moving through before. It's a great area to prepare an ambush. So that's exactly what Saladin does. He prepares an ambush. And on September 3rd, 1191, getting towards the end of summer, the Crusaders arrive at that part of the road where they have to turn away from the Mediterranean coast for a time and leave their fleet. The next day, September 4th, Richard allows his men to have a day of rest before crossing the River of Reeds and the Forest of Arsuf. Right, this is the most dangerous part of their journey. Crossing through woods is always dangerous. Several armies from throughout history can tell you about being ambushed in the woods. Just ask the Roman general Varus about that one. So Richard comes up with a way to delay Saladin. On September 5th, even as the Crusaders are beginning to cross the river, he dispatches an ambassador to Saladin to engage in some fake peace talks. And this only gives him a very short delay, but even the brief negotiations are enough to get the Crusaders across this river and through the forest and to the open plain on the other side, where they're a little bit less vulnerable to ambush. But even here, they're only camped a few miles from Saladin, and they're still isolated from their ships. The next day, as the Crusaders once again form up to resume their slow march south to Jaffa, Richard once again changes up their order of march. He arranges them so that the most veteran troops are on the left. Right, that's the inland side. The east side of this southward-facing army, right? Uh, the knights, the mounted troops, are located in the middle of the army, and then... The pack animals and other more vulnerable parts of the army are located on the seaside. Why would he march in this weird way instead of having his toughest troops at the front and the back? Well, he is expecting Saladin to attack this day, and Saladin is going to attack from the inland side, right, from the east, so... 
Richard wants his toughest troops on that side. And by forming up his troops in this way, when Saladin attacks, he's not going to have to turn his entire army 90 degrees, right? When you try and turn an entire formation, it takes time. And in the meantime, while the formation is moving, people are out of order. Uh, people who are supposed to be protecting uh, the guy to the left or right of them are not in position where they should be. The army is extremely vulnerable. Well, instead, the way Richard has his troops lined up, each individual man just has to turn 90 degrees on command and the entire formation will be facing the enemy. Right? Nobody has to run around from one side of the formation all the way to the other because the whole thing's turning. Just turn left and there you go. And this precaution on Richard's part turns out to be wise because this day, September 5th, 1191, Saladin does strike. His army consists mostly of archers, as well as lightly armored spearmen and lightly armored cavalry with some cavalry archers. I guess the basic underlying theme here is fast-moving, lightly armored troops. And they number nearly 30,000. So the Crusaders are outnumbered about two to one in this fight. And Saladin takes advantage of his numerical superiority the way any decent general would, right? He tries to surround his enemy. He attacks from the inland side, from this strong side of the crusader formation. But his men on the left and right are trying to wrap around and get at the vulnerable sides and back of Richard's army. Well, depending on where you are in the Crusader formation, you likely have a different opinion on how you ought to respond to this. See, the Templars, who are towards the front, they want to keep moving forward. Right. The town of Arsuf is just a few miles ahead, and if they can make it to there, well, they can throw up some defensive fortifications and make a much better fight of it against this superior Muslim force. But the hospitalers who are in the rear are being slowed down by Saladin's attacks, and they want to stop and turn to the left and attack, right? In addition, these troops at the rear are being slowed down by Saladin's attacks, right? When you're being shot at from behind and your best defense is a shield, you've got to kind of turn around or walk backwards or do something else to defend yourself. And this is going to slow down the entire formation. And meanwhile, the Templars at the front who want to get to Arsuf and throw up some fortifications... Well, they're speeding up, and this is causing the entire Crusader column to get stretched out, right? The front is moving faster than it should, and the rear is slowing down. This is not good. Richard himself wants to get to Arsuf and regroup, and he's working hard to keep the army together. Right? He's managing the troops in the middle to sort of spread them out and keep everybody in contact with their neighbors. And there comes a point where the Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller himself comes to see Richard. See, his men are at dire risk of being cut off. So he begs Richard for permission to please launch a counterattack, even if it's not the whole army, let the Knights Hospitaller charge out and see what they can do. They're just getting killed out there. And Richard refuses permission. Well, by midday, the Hospitallers take the initiative and they launch a counter charge on their own. And 
to Richard's credit, he does adjust and he joins the charge with his personal guard. This is how the itinerarium describes the event. Quote, When King Richard saw that the army had been thrown into confusion and was engaging with the Turks, he put spur to horse and galloped swiftly back with his retinue to bring assistance to the hospitalers, who had been the first to attack. He did not slow his charge until he had passed right through the hospitalers' ranks, hurling himself swift as a thunderbolt from the right flank into the daunting crowd of Turkish infantry. Stunned by the strength of the blows he and his force inflicted on them, they fell back to the right and the left. You would have seen so many heaps of those who had suddenly been thrown to the ground and horses without their riders, some groaning and bewailing their harsh fate while others, wallowing in their own blood, breathed their last. A very great number were but headless corpses, trodden underfoot by friend and foe regardless. How distant, how different is the life of contemplation and meditation among the columns of the cloister from that dreadful exercise of war. King Richard pursued the Turks with singular ferocity, fell upon them and scattered them across the ground. No one escaped when his sword made contact with them. Wherever he went, his brandished sword cleared a wide path on both sides. Continuing his advance with untiring sword strokes, he cut down that unspeakable race as if he were reaping the harvest with a sickle, so that the corpses of Turks he had killed covered the ground everywhere for the space of half a mile. The rest panicked at the sight of the dying and gave him a wider berth. Unquote. Now... It goes without saying that the idea of King Richard personally clearing a swath of ground half a mile wide is an exaggeration. The author here is probably talking really about his entire personal guard as well as the Knights Hospitaller and the effect that they all had together. And let's be honest... As with most history, the author of the itinerarium has his own agenda, and we may just be reading a little bit of exaggerated propaganda here, but the net result is the same. The lightly armed, lightly armored Muslim troops on the left flank which had been the crusader rear, is now the left flank, uh, they were not expecting this attack, and they are completely routed. Meanwhile, the rest of the crusader army has not been idle. The infantry in the center have done that little move we talked about, right, where each man turns to his left, and uh, all of a sudden the formation is facing forward. And that line of infantry, or several lines of infantry, really, backed up by crossbowmen, they have started pushing Saladin's lighter-armed troops back in the center. And meanwhile, Guy of Lusignan has joined with the Templars on the right flank, right, what used to be the front of the Crusader column, and he has led a charge against the Muslim right that is similar to Richard's. And uh, Saladin finds very quickly that his army has been blown away on both flanks. That is not a good position to be in as a general in any era with any technology. Right? If you have just been blown away on both flanks, at the very least you need to regroup. And that's what Saladin does, right? His troops in the center, those troops that he still has, well, they've already been pushed back by the Crusader infantry. He regroups them, he forms a new line, and he backs them up with his elite personal guard. And by the time he's done all this and he's starting his counterattack against the Crusader infantry, 
Richard and the Hospitallers on the one side and Guy and the Templars and the other, well, they've completely routed Saladin's cavalry by this point. And they're able to turn back and come crashing in on him from both sides. Right? He has just been enveloped. If he doesn't want to be totally wiped out right now, he needs to get out. And that's what he does. He orders a full retreat, and at the end of the day, his defeat is worse than Acre. Right? We talked about this. When he lost at Acre... All he really lost was a city and some prestige, but in very real terms, you know, at least if you want to look at uh, you know, the broad scope of his empire, Acre is not that big of a deal, and in terms of casualty account, he gave as good as he got at Acre. Well, here in the Battle of Arsuf, Saladin has lost 7,000 men to Richard 700. And unlike Acre, this is not a negotiated surrender. This is a humiliating defeat in the field. But even so, the Ayyubid Empire is immense. And even as Richard is planning his next move... Saladin is sending to the far reaches of his empire for more troops. And at this time, the itinerarium also has him dressing down his generals, blaming them for their troops' poor performance, and in addition, blaming the younger generation of Muslims for not living up to their heritage. This is what he says, according to the itinerarium. Quote, So, what magnificent exploits and extraordinary achievements by my most trusted warriors. They used to be so full of boasting and unbearable arrogance. I had bestowed such great gifts on them so often. And now look, the Christians travel through the land of Syria just as they like, without meeting any opposition or resistance. Where are my soldiers' great boasts and brilliant exploits now? Where are their threats and extraordinary lance thrusts now, and the sword play their great boasts promised? Where are the brilliant opening battle maneuvers? Where are the indescribable armies they boasted they were going to muster against the Christians to destroy them? See, the battle which they sought is now here, but where is the victory they boasted of? How the people of today have degenerated from our noble ancestors, who gained so many brilliant and justly memorable victories against the Christians. Victories which are retold to us daily, and whose memory will endure forever. Things are going differently and shamefully for us. What a disgrace when our people have become the scum of the earth in warfare. We are nothing in comparison to our ancestors. We are not even worth an egg. Unquote. Well, after stopping to resupply at Arsuf, Richard once again leads his army south towards Jaffa, right? That city on the coast that threatens both Jerusalem and Ascalon. And on September 10th, 1191, they finally arrive there. But when they arrive... The Crusaders find that the city has been demolished. Saladin is now enacting a scorched earth policy. And he continues this policy by moving south and burning Ascalon to the ground and destroying the ports there. Thousands of inhabitants of that city are forcibly evacuated. Well, with... Jaffa demolished and Ascalon completely destroyed, Saladin only has to defend one place. He only has to defend Jerusalem. But this actually leads to a divide among the Crusaders. See, Richard argues that with Ascalon abandoned, 
it would be easy to seize the remnants of the city and refortify. That would give the Crusaders the best base of all, right? They could not only threaten Egypt and Jerusalem from Ascalon, they could actually cut off Saladin's supplies from Egypt altogether. But a number of Richard's nobles come together and overrule him. They insist on staying in Jaffa briefly, refortifying there, and then moving inwards directly towards their ultimate objective of Jerusalem. Well, Saladin is not idle during this time. He continues his scorched earth policy, and he burns all of the fortifications between Jaffa and Jerusalem. Any place the Crusaders might take shelter, any place where there are supplies stored, everything gets burned to the ground. And it takes until the end of October for Richard to be ready to depart, but on October 29th, the army heads out. They will be headed inland through scorched land, and leaving their supply fleet in the port. And to stay supplied, they would have to rebuild forts and depots as they go, right? All of these things, which Saladin could very easily burn to the ground, well, it's a lot harder to build those same things back up again. And it's even harder to do it when you have a bunch of cavalry archers constantly harassing you as you work, which is what happens. So the entire march turns into a series of hit-and-run skirmishes. And this is where Saladin's army excels, right? They drive the Crusaders absolutely crazy. And Richard's army gets more stretched out and vulnerable as they go. And in addition to this, winter is now starting to set in. During these many hit-and-run skirmishes, Richard frequently throws himself into the fray. The itinerarium lists several of these small incidents in great detail. And when Richard does this, by the way, he is doing it oftentimes against the objections of his own nobles. Right? They're afraid of what's going to happen to the crusade if Richard dies, right? especially in some random silly skirmish. Right? They could lose everything in a heartbeat. But he doesn't listen. He is always in there, in the fray, fighting whenever he can be. And... He is also pursuing diplomacy constantly. Right? This entire time, Richard remains in communication with Saladin. He is hoping to obtain some kind of negotiated surrender of Jerusalem. It's tough to say how sincere either side is in these negotiations. On the one hand... Richard proposes marrying his sister to Saladin's brother, Safadin, thus creating a neutral kingdom of Jerusalem. Now, this seems like an extreme measure if you're just you know, stalling for time or whatever. But on the other hand, both sides are spying on each other the entire time. Uh, Saladin is finding ways to steal... Uh, prisoners and get them free from Richard's camp. Uh, Richard is paying Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem to give him information on the city's defenses. And after all of this skirmishing and stalling, by January of 1192, the Crusaders are just 12 miles from Jerusalem. They are practically within sight of Bath Horon, which is a town that controls a crucial mountain pass that supplies the city. But on January 10th, the Crusader leaders hold a council, and they decide to pull back from Jerusalem and 
go back to what Richard wanted to do in the first place and go south and refortify Ascalon instead. Now this abrupt reversal seems bizarre at first, right? Didn't the Crusader leaders just have this debate? Well, yes, they did. And that's part of why this is controversial. Now, if you listen to last week's episode, which I don't know why you wouldn't. Uh, this is part three of a short series after all. But anyway, if you listened to last week's episode, you may recall that I went on a bit of a tangent about uh, a paper by a college professor who was fairly critical of King Richard. And that same paper is critical here of King Richard. Uh, the professor berates him for turning back, uh, despite the fact that the troops had high morale and uh, were even buoyed by the fact that they had the true cross from Acre, right? This talisman. Now, if that's all you consider, sure, I guess it could be hard to understand why the Crusaders would turn back now, but... There are other realities at play in warfare, and... Well, look, you can read the paper for yourself if you want to. Uh, the author is Michael Murkowski from Westminster College in Salt Lake City, and the paper is called Richard Lionheart, Bad King, Bad Crusader. It was published in the Journal of Medieval History in 1997, and it's available for free online. And no shade on Professor Murkowski. Look, I'm sure he's very qualified and very smart and a very nice man, but this paper is full of holes and I am triggered. Link in description. Here's why it makes sense for Richard and the other Crusaders to retreat at this point. See, the itinerarium tells us that they retreated on the advice, not of cowardly men, but of the experienced hospitalers and Templars who really had been the backbone of so many of the battles in this crusade up to now. Right, Just a few months ago, these hospitalers at the Battle of Arsuf were charging into the Muslim forces alone against orders. These are not cowardly men. These are not people who are trying to avoid battle. These are people who know and understand battle. And what they say is that they are afraid of besieging Jerusalem. They say that a besieging army could itself be easily cut off from supply. And if that happens, the entire crusade is doomed. And given the mobile nature of Saladin's forces, they believe it is entirely possible for them to be cut off easily. If instead they go to Ascalon, they can use it as a base for raiding Saladin's supply trains from Egypt. Without this vital food, he's going to be in the same situation the Crusaders would be in if they were cut off, right? He will be forced to abandon Jerusalem. Now, part of what this paper from the uh, professor that I mentioned says is that Saladin's supply situation was already so bad that he would likely have been forced to retreat or surrender if the Crusaders had actually forced a siege. But the Crusaders didn't know this. They didn't know his supply situation, so what this entire argument boils down to is a whole lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. Based on the information they had at the time, it made perfect sense for the Crusaders to retreat from Jerusalem. Anyway rant over and continuing the story. The rank-and-file troops, who were not privy to the council, well, they take the retreat from Jerusalem to be a retreat in the face of victory. 
right? These men, many of them, staked their personal fortunes to go on crusade. Many of them only came on crusade for this one reason, to take Jerusalem. And to them, it feels like a betrayal. It feels like the army is being diverted for some other purpose. And the French troops famously desert altogether. They go all the way back to Acre and enjoy some time in the local bordellos. And on January 20th, 1192, ten days after the military council, Richard leads a much depleted force into Ascalon. This city between the kingdom of Jerusalem and Egypt that Saladin has destroyed. The army must now rebuild this city during the winter. And because Saladin also destroyed the port, uh, they must do so with limited access to their supply fleet. In the meantime, Saladin has the opportunity to rest for once. He dismisses his nobles for the winter so their troops can go home to their families and get a little bit of leave time in. And in the meantime, Richard is also trying to convince the French troops to rejoin him. Right, These guys who took off back to Acre and are slumming it in the local whorehouses. He's trying to convince them with uh, marginal success to rejoin the efforts of the crusade. But other events will now complicate matters. Uh, Two things, as a matter of fact. First off, Conrad of Montferrat, this guy who Philip had backed to be king of Jerusalem, well, he finally tries to enforce his right to rule Acre. He takes a fleet of Genoese ships and tries to land them in the city in a fleet of ships from Pisa. This Pisan fleet is uh, allied with Richard, uh, drives the Genoese out, but causes a bit of a commotion, as you can imagine. A naval battle right outside the city fought between two crusader fleets. And the other event that comes into play here is a message that Richard receives from home. Turns out that Prince John has fired some of his appointees, some of the people he had put in charge, in particular of England, uh, during his absence. And uh, John is installing his own people in the government, and Worse, he's diverting tax revenue from the royal treasury to his own treasury. This is an obvious sign that John is slowly taking over the country, and Richard decides he has time for one more campaign season before he has to return home to defend his throne. He decides that he is going to take the route towards Egypt. Right, he wants to hit Saladin right where it hurts, in the breadbasket. And he personally reconnoiters southwards towards Gaza, and he inspects the nearby fortifications at uh, Darum on April 8th, 1192. The itinerarium says, quote, On Wednesday, he set out to Darum in the same way. He walked all round it carefully examining it to see which part seemed most suitable for an assault. The Turks, who had shut themselves up inside Derham, fired many missiles from bows and crossbows at the king and his people, together with insults, although these were incomprehensible. When the king had considered everything, he returned to Ascalon. Unquote. Now, some historians characterize this move south as a naked attempt to seize Egypt for personal gain. But threatening Egypt makes sense, again, from a military perspective, right? If the Crusaders push south, Saladin must move south. And as far as 
military matters are concerned, that's really where the real battle ought to be fought, right? If Saladin has no food, he can't support an army in Jerusalem. On the other hand, as long as he has his base in Egypt, even if the Crusaders take Jerusalem, he can just come back at them again and again and again. So, even if Richard's desire to move into Egypt is only a power grab, it still could potentially be very effective. And, to be frank, as a history buff, it's fascinating to imagine a united Angevin empire with England controlling not just most of France, but also Egypt in the 12th century instead of the 19th. Now, an empire like that, even if Richard's got to go home for a bit, well, same situation as Saladin controlling Egypt, right? That empire can go take Jerusalem at its leisure. But once again, with the prospect of moving south, morale becomes an issue. Right, The men who have come on this crusade will fight fiercely for Jerusalem. But you try to turn them aside towards what appears to be some totally unrelated goal, and many of them will desert. Right? There is a disconnect here between the grand strategy of the war and the stated goals of the crusade, right? the goal of taking Jerusalem. Well, Richard calls his nobles together and says something surprising. He declares his intention to go home. He decides that he needs to put England to rights. And in order to do that, he has to go home. But he will leave several thousand fighting men in the Holy Land at his own expense. And to forestall the potential for any civil war between Guy and Conrad, an election is to be held to settle the kingship of Jerusalem once and for all, right? Is Conrad in charge or is Guy? In April 1192, rather than to allow an open civil war to break out, all parties agree to this election. The Local Outremer counts elect Conrad in a landslide, and he immediately begins preparations to join Richard on crusade, right? This is perfect. He can come down, take command of the army, go take Egypt. Meanwhile, Richard can go home. He can take care of business with John. This will put the crusaders in an excellent position in the following years. The only problem is... He's not going to be around to do this. On April 28th, while returning home from dinner at a friend's house, Conrad is approached by a messenger with a letter. And as he takes this letter from the messenger, another man comes up behind him and stabs him to death. Now, Conrad's allies do capture the murderers, and under torture, the uh, murderers are revealed to be assassins. Yes, the assassins, but there are nonetheless allegations that Richard was somehow involved with the killing. Mostly this seems to be because his nephew would ultimately end up marrying Queen Isabella. Right Again, that unfortunate young lady who became queen of Jerusalem and ended up just being a pawn, getting married over and over and over again. Well, this is yet another one of those incidents that happens to her. And for that reason, right, again, because this new king of Jerusalem is Richard's nephew, Many people assume that Richard has somehow been involved, and these rumors would reach all the way to Duke Leopold of Austria. That guy from earlier who left 
the crusade in anger because Richard had already insulted him? Well, turns out he's Conrad's cousin, and already annoyed at Richard, he is now filled with mortal hatred. And furthermore, rumors that Richard had killed a fellow crusader spread among the French in Acre, and now they are even less eager to rejoin his army. Matter of fact, the only person who really seems to come out of this crusade better than they went into it is uh, Guy de Lusignan. He would receive Cyprus as a consolation prize from Richard for losing the election. Right, as you'll recall, as we discussed in the last episode, Richard had conquered the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean and sold it to the Knights Templar. Well, it had proved a little too restless for the Templars, and they were now willing to give it to Guy basically for free. And surprisingly, Cyprus would remain an independent kingdom in the hands of the House of Lusignan until the year 1489. 200 years after the fall of the last Crusader states, so was Guy the real winner of the Third Crusade? I think you could make a legitimate argument that he was, but Guy's bright political future notwithstanding, Conrad's death has created a real problem for the Crusader armies. See, once again, the entire crusade is in jeopardy. They were going to have a leader. It was going to be Conrad. Richard's still here, but he's about to leave. What are they going to do? Well, a group of nobles led by Henry, Duke of Burgundy, one of the more fervent crusaders, well, they come to Richard and they put him on notice. Whether he's leaving or not, they're going to attack Jerusalem. Well, this has an effect. Richard decides to stay in the Holy Land a little bit longer. He's going to give it one last try. And this is another point where you have to question the narrative that Richard is only interested in personal power or aggrandizement. A man who was motivated by those concerns would do one of two things, right? He would either press really hard for a move on Egypt, go for all the glory, or he would hightail at home to handle his political issues back there. But instead, Richard goes along with this much riskier move on Jerusalem, and he is willing to delay and risk the English throne in the process. It is now summertime. It is June of 1192, and the Crusaders are able to advance quickly towards Jerusalem, right? They're not moving through scorched land in the middle of winter. It's summer, they're well supplied, and the forts along the way, which they had needed to rebuild previously, well, they are now rebuilt. So the Crusader army is able to move very rapidly. That is not to say without opposition, Saladin's horse archers do harass them along the way, but they can't stop the Crusaders from reaching Bath Horon within a week. Right? That important pass we talked about just outside Jerusalem. Well, instead of stopping short of Bath Horon, they get there this time. And when they get there, they arrive at the same time as an Ayyubid supply train bound for Jerusalem. This supply train is loaded with gold, it's loaded with wine, it's loaded with silk, all kinds of goods, and the Crusaders are able to take this. And the taking of this caravan serves as a signal to Saladin that a siege is imminent. So he sends out orders to all of his men from the surrounding area to come into Jerusalem and defend it. And he also has the wells outside of the city sealed up or poisoned. 
But this complicates the Crusaders' position because you, know, you can haul in food, but it's really difficult and inefficient to haul water any long distance. And further complicating the Crusaders' position is the fact that they have just captured all this loot, and among that loot are 4,700 camels. Those camels need to be fed and watered, and so do the Crusaders' horses, and without enough supplies, the army has to turn back again. This time after having been in sight of Jerusalem itself. And at this point, the Crusader army turns openly mutinous. We read in the itinerarium that Henry, Duke of Burgundy, right, this fervent crusader, he writes a song mocking Richard and has it performed openly in the camp, and it becomes popular with the troops. Meanwhile, when the crusaders strike camp and leave, Jerusalem's Muslim defenders cheer that they have been saved by a miracle of Allah. Well, in truth, the siege would have been iffy for both sides anyway, most likely. But at this point in the war, Richard really, really needs to get home. Saladin is badly stressing his empire's resources, and they both begin posturing at least for serious peace talks. Now, Richard returns to Acre, Many of his troops disperse at this time. He is putting together a small assault force to attack the local city of Beirut, uh, just to use as a bargaining chip. But in late July of 1192, Saladin strikes first. He preempts Richard's invasion of Beirut by attacking the Christian-held city of Jaffa. And Saladin does this with a fairly large force of 10,000 men. He attacks on July 27th, and he overruns the city's outer walls within three days, forcing the city's garrison to retreat to the inner citadel, right, the fortress inside the city. But before the outer walls fall, the defenders are able to get a messenger through enemy lines up to Acre to tell Richard what's going on. Now, like we just said, Richard's army has largely dispersed by now. He doesn't have 15,000 men, but he is able to gather all the forces that he does have right now that consists of 54 knights, a few hundred infantry, and 2,000 Italian crossbowmen. And they travel by sea to get to Jaffa as quickly as possible, and simultaneously a force of hospitallers and Templars sets out over land. Now the land force will never make it to Jaffa. They're delayed by Muslim ambushes and forced to stop along the way because they can't get through, but... Theirs is not the only group of crusaders to have trouble. Richard himself is delayed. As you will recall, again from last episode, the crusaders are mostly using cogs for transport, right? These are single-masted ships, and by and large, they can't sail into the wind. So for three days, Richard is basically stuck sitting at anchor, waiting for the wind to change. And when he finally arrives outside of Jaffa, he sees Ayyubid banners flying from the towers on the city wall. And he thinks that the entire city has been taken. Now, in fact, the defenders still hold the citadel, right? Now, tragedy has fallen. Saladin has been holding his troops back as best he can, taking hostages and accepting ransom payments, trying to get a little bit of juice out of this orange. But just the day before, his troops had started massacring hostages. It seems as if the troops involved had been present at Acre, 
when Richard had executed 2,700 Muslim hostages. Uh, these troops want some revenge, so they start killing hostages, and other troops start killing hostages and then start killing other civilians in the city, and it turns into a slow-building massacre. Now, Saladin realizes that he cannot control his men. He sends envoys into the city, urging all the citizens to take shelter in the citadel, but not all of them are able to make it. And it is in this condition that Richard finds the city. But another messenger arrives from inside the citadel. This messenger is asking for help. He's letting Richard know, hey, the garrison is still alive, still fighting, and by the way, there are a bunch of civilians in here. This is how the itinerarium describes King Richard's response. Quote, When the king heard this, he said, If it so pleases God, in whose service and with whose leadership we have come here, that we should die with our brothers, death only to those who do not advance. So, on the king's command, the galleys were driven towards the shore. With no armor on his legs, he threw himself into the sea first, up to his groin, and forced his way powerfully onto dry land. The first and next after the king were Geoffrey Dubois and Peter de Pro. All the rest followed them, jumping into the sea and advancing on foot. They boldly attacked the Turks, who obstinately opposed them on the shore. The whole shore was covered with them. The outstanding king shot them down indiscriminately with a crossbow he was carrying in his hand, and his elite companions pursued the Turks as they fled across the beach, cutting them down. At the sight of the king, they had no more spirit in them. They did not dare approach him. Unquote. The crusaders are able to quickly establish a beachhead outside of the city and land all of their archers and footmen, and characteristically, once Richard has started into a battle, he does not stop. He leads his men into the city, where they find a number of Ayyubid troops still looting. They start to force these soldiers out of the city, and when the city garrison sees them, the garrison also joins in, and all the Ayyubids inside the city of Jaffa are either killed or forced out. And Richard follows up. He continues to pursue them all the way to Saladin's camp, and Saladin himself is forced to pack up and leave. As far as the Crusaders are concerned, Saladin has completely left the area. Now, unbeknownst to them he has successfully rallied his army a few miles away, and he decides that he is going to launch a counterattack. He can still take the city of Jaffa by taking the Crusaders by surprise. So on the morning of August 4th, Saladin has his army disperse through some grain fields outside the city. They are concealing themselves in the tall crops. And because the Crusaders think that all of Saladin's men have fled, they aren't really taking any precautions, which should make conditions perfect for a surprise attack, but there is one Genoese crossbowman who decides he's just going to take a walk outside the city early in the morning. And while he's out taking his early morning constitutional, this crossbowman spots some of Saladin's men forming up. So he runs back into the city and warns Richard, who sounds the general alarm and has all of his men drawn up for battle. So when Saladin arrives, he does not find an unprepared city with you know, a bunch of disorganized men sort of randomly milling about and going about their everyday lives, he finds a crusader shield wall backed by crossbowmen and 54 mounted knights. Meanwhile, 
Saladin's army, the troops he was able to rally, well, they are almost entirely light-armored cavalry. And his cavalry charge multiple times at the Crusader shield wall. The goal is to get them to break. But the Crusaders do not break, they stand firm. And meanwhile, whilst the shield wall is standing firm, the crossbowmen behind the shield wall are firing in volleys. Right? One rank fires, then the next rank fires, then the next rank. And in this way, they're keeping up a constant rain of fire on Saladin's men. On the other hand, the Muslim arrows are not nearly as effective against crusader armor as the crossbow bolts are against the much lighter Ayyubid armor. And this repeated series of charges, while being shot at, not only tires out the Ayyubid's horses, but it wears at their morale, and eventually they start to waver. And at the opportune moment, when it looks like they might just be about to run, Richard leads a countercharge with his own mounted knights. And without the benefit of the element of surprise, Saladin's lightly armored cavalry, worn out and tired as they are, are no match for the European knights, and he is again forced to withdraw. But after this whole adventure at Jaffa, both sides are even more exhausted. Both sides need peace. And Richard has also gotten sick again. So, through messengers, with Richard lying in bed, peace terms are negotiated. The Crusaders will get to keep Jaffa and Acre, and the Muslims will keep Jerusalem at Ascalon, but the fortifications at Ascalon must be destroyed to prevent the city being used as a base for military activity. There will be a three-year truce, during which Christian pilgrims will be allowed to visit Jerusalem unmolested, except for the French who deserted Richard. Those knights will not be allowed to enter, and yes, Richard actually puts that in the treaty. Now, both sides do seem to expect that the war will resume in three years, right? This is just a truce to regroup, rearm, and resupply. And the itinerarium says, quote, So this was done in the moment of necessity. The king, whose great spirit was already aiming higher, undertaking difficulty, striving for the top, sent ambassadors to Saladin. While many of Saladin's satraps listened, they said that the king had only sought a truce like that for three years because he intended to return to see his country, to get more people and money. Then he would return and tear the whole country of Jerusalem from Saladin's dominion, if indeed Saladin thought he could resist him with any confidence. Saladin sent messengers with a reply to this. He called to witness his holy law and all-powerful God that he sought so highly of King Richard's prowess, noble mind, and superiority that if he had to lose the country during his lifetime, he would prefer that King Richard capture it through the means of his virtues than any other prince whom he had ever seen. What deep blindness obscures human eyes. They make plans for a long time ahead, but they do not know what the next day may bring forth. So the king's sharp mind reached far ahead, making mental arrangements for the future, hoping that he would receive the Lord's sepulchre sometime, but completely unaware that all human affairs hang by a slender thread. Unquote. And, in fact, Richard and Saladin would never meet again in battle. Within a year... Saladin would be dead, through natural causes. Famously, at the time of his death, 
he is so poor that donations have to be raised to pay for his burial. And throughout his life, every penny he has gained from his conquests has gone to his poor subjects. The Ayyubid Empire he had established did not outlive the next generation. His sons would divide the territory back into Fatimid Egypt and Syria, and over later generations, the dynasty would die out altogether. Saladin's empire was the empire of one man, and not a new, unified nation. And in many ways, Richard's empire, the Angevin empire, which he inherited from his father Henry, is the same way. He has to hurry home now if he's going to save it. But fate intervenes, and as has happened so many times in this story, Richard is delayed once again. En route back to England, his fleet encounters a storm, and he has to land on Byzantine territory on the island of Corfu. There, the Byzantine emperor orders him detained because he had conquered the island of Cyprus, which, if you'll recall, was technically Byzantine territory. It was ruled by a rebel warlord, but technically it was Byzantine territory, and Richard had gone and conquered it and sold it. Well, the Byzantine emperor has him not locked up for this, but he is not allowed to leave the island of Corfu. Well, Richard doesn't want to wait to see what happens, so he disguises himself as a knight Templar and, along with four companions, leaves on a much smaller ship on a much shorter voyage to Austria. And from there, he intends to travel to England by land via Central Europe. But if he's going to do this, he's going to have to pass through the lands of none other than Leopold of Austria. That's the duke who he insulted at Acre, and who is Conrad of Montferrat's cousin, who thinks that Richard killed Conrad. Well, as Richard is passing through Leopold's lands, he is betrayed by one of his companions, and just before Christmas of 1192, he is taken prisoner by Leopold, who holds him hostage. Now, in a different situation, with a different family dynamic, Richard might have expected to be released relatively quickly, but Prince John, who the itinerarium calls Count John, well, he doesn't pay the ransom quickly, no. He delays, and he uses this need to raise a king's ransom. A literal king's ransom is a lot of money, by the way. There's a reason that phrase exists. Well, Count John, if you will, uses this ransom as an excuse to hoard more money, to abscond with more funds, and to levy more taxes. Again, tying us back into the Robin Hood legend and the evil Prince John, as he is remembered in the tales. Now, Richard himself is often blamed, both in the stories and by historians, and indeed in English culture, uh, he is often blamed for not spending enough time in England. And to be fair, he spent very little of his time in England, but at this particular time he has little choice because he's in prison. And alone in captivity, we see an artistic side of Richard come out. He writes a song dedicated to his half-sister Marie. The song is called jean en Prix, which roughly translates as No Man Who Is Imprisoned. And one English translation reads in part, quote, No prisoner can tell his honest thought 
unless he speaks as one who suffers wrong, but for his comfort as he may make a song. My friends are many, but their gifts are not. Shame will be theirs if, for my ransom here, I lie another year. They know this well, my barons and my men, Normandy, England, Gascony, Poitou, that I had never follower so low whom I would leave in prison to my gain. I say it not for a reproach to them, but prisoner I am. The ancient proverb now I know for sure. Death and a prison no nor kind nor tie, since for mere lack of gold they let me lie. Much for myself I grieve, for them still more. After my death they will have grievous wrong, if I am a prisoner long. What marvel that my heart is sad and sore, when my own Lord torments my helpless lands. Well do I know that, if he held his hands, remembering the common oath we swore, I should not hear, imprisoned with my song, remain a prisoner long. Unquote. We'll talk about Richard's eventual release and the rest of the story in our next episode. Lionheart, The Aftermath. <laughs> Hello again. It's Dan, and I'm here to ask for your help. See, we're trying to promote this show and get the word out to as many people as possible, so if you have a minute, please share on your favorite social media. Send a link to the episode or even to our website at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. If this is your first time listening to the show... Don't miss a future episode. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, Google, Spotify, or just about any other service you want to listen to a podcast on. You can find an RSS link as well as a link to all these other services, again, at dantollerpodcast.com. If you want news on the latest episodes or anything that is upcoming in the world of relevant history, you can find us at Dan Toller Podcast on Twitter or at Dan Toller on Facebook. Finally, if you've got a few dollars and you'd like to provide some financial support to the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. Alternatively, you can also support the show at subscribestar.com. You can find us there at Relevant History. And for everything else, including links to interviews and my blog, which may or may not ever get updated, once again, Dan Toller Podcast, Dan T O L E R Podcast.com. Thanks for listening.